Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the Council, this is regarding the Stanford General Use Permit. Uh, in late 2018, the county approached the communities of Athens, Menlo Park, EPA, Woodside, Pico Valley, and Redwood City, and advised that the county had been invited to the negotiating table with the county of Santa Clara and their discussions with Stanford regarding their application. Uh, the county invited the jurisdictions to be begin a collaborative process to provide some feedback and comments on it. Uh, after a couple of preliminary meetings, uh, each jurisdiction was asked to provide some specific feedback. We provided a vote list of about four items, which are in your staff report, and those have been shared with the council uh, prior. And basically, it was related to you know transportation issues, traffic congestion, contributions to bike bed, drainage, and then some in-lieu uh, housing, just in case there's uh, academic housing that's uh, property bought up in the town. Um, the county has asked that uh, at the uh, ad hoc level there could be a council member or two to be appointed, so the mayor's uh, been asked to appoint uh, two members of the council to serve, one is primary, one is liaison, but both can actually participate. Uh, and so I put it on the agenda tonight just for some additional council feedback. You may have noticed in the paper, uh, and there was a letter from, uh, an email from Mike Callaghy, uh, that being at the table is now kind of in question. Uh, but there's still uh, the opportunity to be a participant in the advisory committee at the, at the county level. So I think our process should at least continue with that expectation. That concludes the staff report. Okay, any questions for George on this item? I know that there, was, uh, there were a lot of links that you gave us. Yes, a lot to read. Yeah, so um, just a little comment. I attended uh, one of the first um, public hearings that the supervisor had, uh, Joseph Lane, at, uh, over a year ago now, uh, with uh, at, at Palo Alto Council Chambers about it, or when a lot of the residents came and spoke, and uh, there's just a, a huge concern in the area that uh, uh, the Stanford University is uh, overbuilding uh, to tax uh, all the uh, services and housing and traffic, and so it, it really is a, a, a big issue. Um, it, but in lots of ways, uh, Stanford's like the ranking down the gorilla at the table and likes to uh, um, put its weight around. So, so I think uh, I didn't see the map in your pack, but for those of you who didn't go to the website, um, I guess there's a there's a map that shows. The areas that, that may be affected by land acquisition <coughs> and covers essentially it's a six mile radius mm -hmm. and uh, where they can acquire land much like they're doing down in, on El Camino and, and building housing and may, it'll be non-taxable. I, I don't know that they're just acquiring land, this is land that they, they own, own yeah. already that they have leased yeah. in 50 or 100 year leases and yeah. a lot, I mean, I actually owned a home uh, in Menlo Park that was on Stanford Lease land. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sold it a number of years ago, but uh, they're not in the uh, habit or in the mindset of renewing some of these uh, long-term leases that are starting to expire. Mm -hmm. They're planning to take them over and they will literally take over the asset. Yeah. And then they'll use that for housing or other type of activity and not paying taxes. Mm -hmm. Do we know if there is housing in Atherton that is owned by Stanford? Do we, do we have any, do we, do we get any record if there is housing that is basically tax exempt in Atherton because it's yeah. owned by a nonprofit? Yeah. yeah, that's part of our annual property tax report from HTL, so we do know that, but I don't believe there's any from Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. Most of it is along like that Bay Laurel, San Francisco Creek area, mm -hmm. and then further up in the. There's some in Redwood City. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you know, clearly there'd be an impact if Stanford were actively acquiring property in our town and mm -hmm. removing it from the tax rolls because it would have an impact on us and on the county. Uh, but frankly, I think the real serious impact here is exactly the same impact that we have with Menlo Park and Redwood City, mm -hmm. which is development on our fringe that has a big impact on us in terms of traffic and uh, mostly traffic, but just basically growth that impacts us. And this is something we've talked about 
uh, a lot, right? And really haven't, I mean, it, I know we're gonna do a goal setting session <coughs> in the next couple months, and that, you know, this is something we should focus on, but obviously we're in a tough position because we don't really have leverage. Well, there's a, another issue is the, the schools. So we have, the school districts aren't sitting at the table because they're asking jurisdictions. And so our residents will be paying for expansion to schools for children who are living in non-taxable apartments and homes. And I know one of the requests, I think it's from Palo Alto, that could have been from Menlo Park, is for Stanford to build another school, mm -hmm. or maybe a school at a couple different levels yeah. because of that impact. But there's the issue, I think, that there's been a, some sort of agreement in, for that area down on Menlo Park on ECR, where they're going to put, I think, four or five hundred home or four or five hundred apartments. The Ariaga development. Yeah, it's being. Yeah. Right, right. That's Stanford land. Yeah. And Menlo Park tried to uh, require more housing, and a lot of people feel that they didn't get enough housing on it. But I mean, it went back to the drawing board several times. Yeah. Just and there's some agreement about taxes, property tax, whatever the property tax would have been, Stanford's going to contribute. There's just a one time, one time fee. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the county knows the answer. Uh, Stanford's general plan, they've been working with the county for the past 10 years, probably in modification, uh, yeah, which is a huge general plan. It's moving a city. And I don't know if you guys have any, you know, kind of insight from the county perspective on what potential growth considerations, because transition of leasehold interest land is something that I know has been on the option table, but I know the development component is pretty much closer to the Stanford campus component. Yeah, uh, isn't it okay if I speak from here? I don't know. Yeah, no. Um, yes. uh, so, um, it's important. My um, involvement in this process has been reviewing their general use plan, which is really their traffic studies that are associated with the developments. And our, first of all, we've been a little bit um, at odds with Santa Clara County because we haven't really been included in the process. They've taken our comments, but not necessarily addressed them to our satisfaction. So um, I went down to a planning commission meeting last summer and made that point to the planning commission. Um, they claim that they will work with us on next year's general use plan, but their assumptions on their traffic generation numbers are just, um, frankly unbelievable in our eyes. I mean, they're assuming no net new trips with mm. something like 9,000 more students or mm. employees on the campus. Yeah. It's just, it, it's not believable. So we have made that point in all of our comments. Um, I know that uh, Mike Callagy and I believe Supervisor uh, Don Horsley, I think went down and met with Joe Smitty about some of the issues that they're having with this. And I think um, your city manager uh, Mr. Roberts was involved in a couple of meetings that we've had talking with elected officials about the negotiation on how much we feel this county should get in terms of mitigation um, to mitigate for the traffic impacts that we see coming. I think that's that's about all I know about that. George, do you have anything to add? Because you've been no, that's, that's good summary. I, I, I had a question. I, I think what they're claiming is there's no net new commute trips. Yeah. Correct. It, it, I, I, is that limited to commute, or is that, I mean, because there's going to be an awful lot of traffic, but not necessarily commute traffic. So they do the analysis based on peak period, and so it's, yeah, it's during the peak, yeah. uh, and they're claiming that their uh, transportation demand modeling and their um, alternate methods of getting people around are going to have net, net new trips onto that peak period. I just can't believe that. Well, and they're claiming, I had the same <clears throat> reaction, and, and I noticed that they're claiming they are on track with their current plan. Yeah which is also no net new commute trips. And I'd love to find out if that's the case, if they are tracking to their plan and if they have done what they said they were doing last time. Because it is almost unbelievable when you look at it, so you're gonna add all these people and it's not gonna increase traffic, it just feels well, well, hard to believe. They do have, you know, they have that margarita <clears throat> bus system. Right. And those buses are, they didn't used to be full and they are packed now. So I know that they're, and they've added new buses and they've brought in a, a new subcontract so there are new buses, so there are new routes, but mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that they've 
currently they've got a pretty good network and, and more and more people are using it because there's no parking there because they're doing all this construction and they're not letting anybody park there. So, Mayor, yeah, go ahead. are the margaritas uh, for commuters? I think it's more for kind of local trips, you know, from one place to another rather than bringing it does commutes in. Yeah. It, it picks up train, people yeah. from the train and brings yeah. them in. Yeah, yeah and, and that's and not like. Well, I guess that is a commute. Yeah. Well, my, my wife you know, works at the Cancer Research Center, and she takes the, the Marguerite from, mm -hmm. from the train station to, to the hospital and then back. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I know that, and it is said that that Bohannon route is, uh, didn't used to have anybody on it, and now it's packed. Okay. And uh, so the Palo Alto one is also packed, and I think I think they have a full size bus now, where they used to just have one of those little buses. So, I'm not saying that they've got it all covered, but I do think that you know, I can understand where they're saying that they think that they're on track for now or for the 2008 study. But I agree with, you, with everybody. Not. Like I don't it know. Needs to be. I go on campus fairly often. And it's really hard to find parking in those parking garages. They are packed. Mm -hmm. I mean, really hard to find parking. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. there's people, there's people on the road related to Stanford. There's no question yeah, about yeah. it. And I don't know if it's the concept of making it torturous so that people get on bikes and walk because that's the only or public transportation because driving your car there's missing. So mm -hmm. just. One other thing that I didn't see addressed in here is uh, sort of a transitionary issue, but during construction, there's a lot of Stanford traffic. Mm -hmm. And I'd like that to be addressed in some form or fashion. Somebody should be made aware of that, so there's a way to mitigate that. Because that's been an issue, that is an issue today. Yeah. Uh, I mean, El Camino is in, in many ways a Stanford highway at some time today. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when they were knocking down those buildings, and when they start building, they're going to be just like they are in Redwood City, having construction equipment in, in one or two of the lanes and shrink everything down and that'll last for a year. Okay. I think our best opportunity, again, is to participate with, and leverage, is to participate with the county mm -hmm. and just with their ad hoc committee on it. I think we're one of our own. So if I could two, two other thoughts for me. Uh, one is, it, if you look at the amount of area, that's the 2,700 acres in, in uh, San Mateo County versus whatever it is, 4,700, 4,800, something like that. And, Santa Clara, Santa Clara County does seem to be getting the lion's share of the attention from any newspaper article I read and everything else. I, I'd encourage the county, San Mateo well, County. I think it's San Mateo County approval that's required. San, not, they don't, San Mateo County doesn't have that leverage. Well, that's my, that's my, my point is they're saying there's 7,000 acres in, in, involved. And some of it is in San Mateo County. And some of the general, this is a general use plan that is, I hope, I mean, I just hope San Mateo County gets our input yeah. in. Yeah. So Go ahead, yeah. I do got a little doubt. So the the Stanford's permit is through the county of Santa Clara. Clara. Right. Technically San Mateo County is not eligible for the mitigation money that they'll be collecting from Stanford. Okay. Now I think for the project the mitigation amount was like it was like four hundred fifty million. It was a lot of money. And Stanford has sued uh, Santa Clara County over that fee. What we're interested in, more or less, is to make sure that San Mateo County gets to participate in the mitigation um, measures that are resulting from this big development. Because, like you've been speaking, um, that border is arbitrary. I mean, there's a lot of Stanford students that live in San Mateo County yeah. as well as faculty. Yeah. So to just limit the mitigation money into Santa Clara County is not fair to San Mateo County. And that's part of what um, this group of um, elected officials and uh, Supervisor Horsley and my colleague are gonna try to go and argue. They have talked with Supervisor Samidian, and Supervisor Samidian has been very cooperative. He's a very sharp man, so we're hoping that we can um, continue those good conversations with, with Supervisor Samidian. So the 2,700 acres in unincorporated San Mateo County are completely unaffected by the development? I think it's the part up by um, uh, Searsville Dam. I know that's in the county, that area up there. Oh, 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 oh. I, I was it thinking. Could be, I, I could be totally wrong. Yeah. I think there's land in the county, but I don't think that that gives the county any decision making authority over the use permit. I think the use permit is totally a Santa Clara County thing, and that's why that's what we read about in the paper. 
there before Santa Clara County in order to get the permit they need to do the development they want to do. Right, but I assume Santa Clara County can't approve a, a plan that had, that affects directly us. affects a, a different county. I mean, so well, I, think they, I actually think I, they can, and that, that's right? exactly I, what he's speaking to. So they can approve construction in San, in San Mateo County? Well, yeah. I mean, in Santa Clara County. Yeah. Yeah. In Santa Clara, that's, that's the point. That's the point, that's the, point. That's the question. But the construction yeah. is not on the piece that's in San Mateo County. That's, that's what he's saying, right. yeah. That, I, yeah. I think that when this was brought up, the Stanford actually went to San Mateo County as a courtesy to get them involved in the process. They didn't. They weren't obligated to. They actually did it as a courtesy to be involved. And I think to Jim's point, it's the mitigation measures because even though the property that they're talking about, you know, primarily Santa Clara County, because if it did apply to San Mateo County, we would be directly impacted as far as involvement. So this so is it's exclusively Santa Clara County. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's an exactly the same issue we face with Menlo Park and Redwood City, just at a lesser scale. Yeah. 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 Same yeah. issue, same leverage issues. Yeah. So my other point is going to the four, the four issues, which I thought were really useful. Mm -hmm. But um, we, we have, since probably this started, we've had a new conversation about our train and what we might be doing with the, 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 the rail crossings. And that directly could affect transportation. You know, um, and I don't know whether we should fold that in any way or not. For example, um, I, I could see a scenario where we are um, doing something with the expedited track. I don't know if the road's going to go under the track or we might do something. Yeah, I, that should be part of this conversation, it seems. With the Caltrain track. Yeah, and the, tra and the transportation consequence, uh, you know, effects of that. Well, as you, as you might working on the transportation committee and you guys are starting to look at right. that issue, I think you should consider some of the information that's in here and then they should consider it too when they're thinking about, you know, do we need to mitigate some traffic or put in some traffic management devices on some key streets. Yeah. So I mean, obviously if we're going to have, what it was, 30 trains come by every hour or something. Yeah. Yeah. Then every increase in traffic is going to just make it worse. Uh, yeah, and it's it's an issue. And when I think about the impact on San Mateo County from Stanford, I don't think there's any place that gets hit more than the Dumbarton Bridge and all of the streets related to it. Uh, you know, there's loads of people going to Stanford across that bridge because there's so much housing in the East Bay. It's it, it, it is very similar to how we're impacted by Menlo Park and Redwood City. Yeah. It's just not fair. So I will say that I'm supportive of the county taking the leadership role because actually I'm very pleased with their efforts and their relationship with Stanford in general. This is obviously a money related issue mm -hmm. with Santa Clara County and a fairness issue on our part because we do bear some of the burden. So, you know, an ad hoc committee to me sounds very reasonable to join with. Comments? Okay. I think we were just getting in the swamp. Yeah, you can, you can uh, let me know what your ad hoc committee will be, um, and I can share that with the rest of the time. Okay, great. No problem. So we'll move on to item number two. All right. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. Um, last year, you received a couple of reports regarding the Atherton Channel District. Um, some of the challenges that it faces with regards to its finances. Um, just as a reminder, the district is encompassed of not only Atherton parcels, but some parcels in unincorporated county in Menlo Park. Um, the town parcels constitute about 55% of the district. Um, and we had talked about some potential financing options and you had asked for additional information um, we have NBS, um, Tim uh, Superd with us, uh, to help us uh, go through some of those options for you. All right, good afternoon. Hello. Shall I sit, stand? What's your, what's your name? Whatever you makes want. you uncomfortable. Most comfortable. <laughs> uh, I will stand for a minute, as long as it doesn't bother anybody. No. Um, in talking to, to Robert about this, what I thought would be good is to literally condense a lot of information into just a few slides and then focus on the three tools that I think 
are going to make the most sense for this discussion. But I wanted to at least give you an overview. And when I'm done, actually, we just recently put together a booklet called a 10-step funding plan for stormwater. So it's very sort of uh, apropos for this discussion. So the most important thing is people always want to jump right to the final equation. You know, oh, let's do an assessment district or let's do a fee or whatever. You, you obviously know what's going on in your town, but I have to remind people so that, you know, develop the priorities before you pick the tool, right? So the, the thing that is important in this discussion, though, is to recognize the difference between capital and ongoing services, right? So operations and maintenance is one half of the equation, the capital is another. And a lot of times there are, two, there are different funding tools that work well for one or the other, not necessarily both. But there are some that work for both. So what, what we developed in the last couple of years is this 10-step plan. And again, I'm going to focus on a couple things. But just to make sure everybody's sort of on the same page, so, so to say, is when you're looking at stormwater, there, there are legitimate reasons to look at your other utilities. Right? Sanitary sewer is often affected by stormwater when there's overflow and that kind of thing. So there are, there are reasons to look at that. I don't believe we're going to really talk about that tonight. Um, there are also development impact fees, which are one-time fees for capital only. So here's that, you know, that juxtaposition between one-time capital and ongoing maintenance. There's regulatory fees, which obviously are you know, fees and the regulation of stormwater and other types of things, there's you know, fire, all these different regulatory fees that are out there. The one that we will talk about though in a couple minutes in more detail is this concept of the property related fee that you may have heard of, right? Burlingame has one, Palo Alto has one. They're fairly rare um, across California, but there are a few sort of examples locally. Um, the GO bond, right, the general obligation bond, is an avenue for one-time capital if you get your voters to obviously approve a GO bond. Um, the, the one we're going to talk in more detail is the CFD, which is the Community Facilities District. It's basically a more developed version of a parcel tax, which is number seven on my, on my list here. So those are really, six and seven are very interrelated. They're sort of cousins, if you will. Um, the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, which you're all probably familiar with, right? That was the Bay Area parcel tax, $12 a year for all 2 million parcels around the Bay. So that's a parcel tax. The CFD is, is similar, and I'll get into some details on that in a minute. Then there's the assessment district, which we've had in California since you know, 1913 at least. <laughs> Uh, there's the 13 Act Assessment District, 15 Act. There's all these different older laws that are for assessments and the benefit, and, and I'll talk about that in a second. Obviously, grants can sometimes be a source, but they're very difficult to get. And then, of course, if you don't get any of those nine approved, <coughs> you know where it, it ends up in is your general fund, which I'm sure is not a wash and lots of money. So. So that's kind of the 10, and I'm going to focus again on, on these three areas because as I understand, what you're trying to fund fits into these buckets more. If you want to talk about, you know, a geo bond or something, we'll definitely, we can do that. But you've got the first, the first one on my list here, and not in order of priority, but just that's the way it came up, <laughs> is the assessment district. So you have to prove benefit with an assessment district. There's actually specific laws for flood control. The 1982 Act, right, is a benefit assessment district. It's used all over the state for, for flood control and related measures. But you have to show benefit, and you have to look at a lot of different criteria and do what's called an assessment engineer's report. And you have to separate out the general benefit and only assess properties for the special benefit. And there's an art and science that's yes. So I, I don't understand that. Um, are you talking, I mean, we have an assessment district here, right? This is, the channel district is an assessment district. It was established by state law. And there's an opinion from the attorney general about it that preceded Prop 13. Right. Uh, and, and it authorized a bond. 
and we never did the bond. So, and then it got repealed by Prop, that all got repealed because Prop 13 replaced it. But do, we, I mean, I'm just not, what I'm confused about is whether you're talking about a special assessment is in the context of this channel district existing, or are you talking more generally, well, you know, to address need? There's a difference between, yeah, the channel district is, a, is, is really a special district, so it's right. like a town or a county, so right. it's an agency of government. But the, with the assessment district I'm talking about is the actual financial tool. So whether I'm the town of Atherton or I'm the channel district, I may have a credit card in my wallet, I may have cash, I may have you know some other kind of funding. That's that's what this assessment but, district is. Right. Okay. So that's what I'm trying to understand. So to leverage the assessment, the special assessment that you're talking from the uh, channel district, that would be that would necessarily apply to all of the parcels that make up the channel district. It would only apply to those that would get a benefit. Correct. As a result of the assessment, is that right? Yes, that's the way they typically work. And I know there was a question that was circulated about what if what if I sequester all my storm water on my property and I have percolation ponds or I have that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Those things can be brought into the equation here. So let's say you have exactly equal parcels. You have an acre here and an acre there. This one is all completely covered in asphalt, and creates a lot of runoff. And this one has, you know, different types of the ways to sequester the storm water. There may be a reason then to tax this property you know, $100 and this one zero or 10 or whatever the, you know, the metrics might be. So there's ways of looking at it, but you're talking about benefit. Um, so that requires a parcel by parcel assessment in terms of benefit. It does, yeah. You can do categories you know, and group together and maybe you look at impervious area or you know different things without getting you know extremely detailed on each and every parcel. Does that make sense? Can I just follow yeah. up a question sure. on with that? Because what I'm hearing you say that um, that would go beyond the physical boundaries of our current channel as district assessment right. district because you know I've got I'm not in the channel district. I don't think. I think you are. You think yeah. I am? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sure okay. you are. Yeah. Because it's all right. But, um, but I, I, you're not. Yes, you are. We'd have to have a discussion have. of the boundaries. Right. There's, a, yeah. there's a separate a discussion, well. yes, about the boundaries, but you wouldn't be able to assess properties that are outside of your area without some kind of agreement or what have you. The town could, in theory, have an assessment district town wide. Huh. And even though not all parcels are in the channel district, but again, that's a different conversation. And you have the, real, the, the real question is, could the channel district have an assessment district-wide, so every parcel in the district with assess? Yes. Yeah. I mean, as the ch as the board of that district, you can assess in your in the channel district, or if you're wearing your town hat, you could do it town-wide. Okay. Then sense. I'll take that. My excuse me. My little example. If I'm in the channel district and you're going to assess me, but my property has all the bells and whistles for retaining all of my water mm. that comes onto my property, it doesn't flow away. It goes into my giant detention trench, and you know it's all hard piped in there. Well, so I would pay less. No exemption. Yeah. So you would. You're, that's where yes, you're yes, like yes, exactly. doing a. Okay. A parcel by parcel <laughs> analysis, right? But and so I think that you're going to find it to, to follow up on, on on Elizabeth's comments. Over the last ten, 10 years, years we've years. been telling people, yeah. you do anything, you've got to put a retention pond in. Yeah, uh, big ones that big cost ones. hundreds and hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. People complain about it all the time. Okay, and now we're going to say, oh, by the way, you're going to get a chance to pay an extra tax too. People are not going to vote for that. So the, 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 the theory is either if we have town-wide drainage projects that, are, that everybody benefits from. If we want to create an assessment district that's town-wide, we do the engineering report and all that, but we have to identify the specific projects in order to establish a budget from which to draw the assessment. 
But if we're just talking about projects within the existing channel district, Different story. Mm -hmm. that creates the project identification, which then triggers the engineer's report, which then triggers how much we need to assess each parcel in order to meet that target for the budget the project, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Because if we're doing, a, Elizabeth, I think the point being that if you're doing it based on flow or you're in an area, your property may be the better one of the bunch, right. but yet downstream there are other issues that are created by water that continues to go on as well. Therefore, you can benefit by not having water in your roofway at El Camino and Alejandra. Therefore, you receive a benefit. I have a river that runs in front of my house when it rains and it flows to El Camino. It literally is <laughs> four feet high and then it goes away. In an engineering well, perspective, what is the, I mean, because I know that we've done impervious area <coughs> analysis to determine area of impact to the channel. Is there any other engineering philosophy that we could look at other than just a blanket town wide? Because a town wide may not, because the way mm -hmm. the town's divided, mm -hmm. portion of this doesn't go even anywhere right. near the channel. Mm -hmm. Is there any other? Well, I, I think you can look at the different drainage areas and drainage basins that go to, mm -hmm. you know, some stuff goes to the Atherton Channel, other stuff goes the other direction towards Redwood Creek. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, we have issues in Lloyden Park, for example, that are not tied to the Atherton Channel. Right. And so we have town-wide drainage issues that were identified in the uh, drainage study that was uh, recently completed. So the master, the, the master plan that mm -hmm. has that whole list of mm -hmm. uh, drainage priority projects. Mm -hmm. And so you can either look at it as a holistic town-wide approach of addressing town-wide drainage issues, or you can cut it up into individual drainage areas and apportion it to those areas. So if we did a town-wide component, doesn't it nullify the special, uh, the apply specifically to the Atherton Channel? Because 50% of it wouldn't apply to the Atherton Channel. We'd have to dissolve, in essence, this existing. No, you, don't you, don't, you don't have to dissolve it. it. It'd just be an overlay on top. So an ad. Yeah. But, but that might make more sense then as a parcel tax or a drainage tax or something mm -hmm. other than an assessment district. Right. And so uh, I'm deeply rooted in the history of this. And I don't know how much other people know, but, I, but I've done a lot of review on it. And I gave Jennifer the Attorney General's legal opinion that was issued, I think, in 1958. 58? Eight. Yeah. Mm. We, so, you know, there's been a lot of analysis, including our master plan, about drainage issues in Atherton, and we're divided into different areas where the drainage occurs. And there's been lots of information about the channel before it was lined with concrete, and the whole Sequoia district area that drains from Euclid and down uh, on the other side of Stockbridge into Redwood Creek. Those, from what I've read, those are the two big areas. And there are some other areas that are smaller, but those are the big areas. And the, dis the Atherton Channel District was created to fund the, uh, you know, uh, formalizing of the concrete channel, which had been just a creek. Mm. And you don't have huge flooding problems, but my guess is part of the reason you don't mm -hmm. is because a lot of stormwater is pulled into the channel. And if, if the channel weren't pumped, if, if there hadn't been the engineering to pull stormwater into the channel, I mean, I, I'm not certain that you would be flooded, but, but not too far from you. The big issues, and there's lots of press on it, is uh, from Elena to El Camino mm -hmm. and between Atherton Avenue and Valparaiso. Mm. Those areas were just totally flooded, Park Lane all the way down. So my guess is you would have been hit. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of benefit that was provided by the money that was spent to formalize the channel as a way to take all that stormwater. Mm. Um, and the, the problem that I see is that before Prop 13, the Channel District received $480,000 a year. Mm -hmm. After Prop 13, that number dropped to $30,000. Yeah. 
and it's now up to something like 70,000 yeah. because the taxes have grown since 1978. But that difference between before and after Prop 13 is a huge issue and, and you know, we suffered what, I mean, you know, there are, we paid for a huge piece of the work that we did on the channel off Marsh Road from general funds, which means that there was a great benefit for some residents and no benefit for some residents. Mm -hmm. Other than their, you know, their. So uh, they're able to drive road. without yeah. following right. the I, I understand. So, yeah. you know, but still, there's probably some people that don't, don't get a benefit from that. And and now we're we've got these needs for the channel and how and we're looking at how do we pay for that? And mm -hmm. I'm thinking it. I mean, we should. That, that's a channel district responsibility. And how do we get to the point? of assessing people in the channel district and, and it's particularly complicated because Atherton property represents slightly less than fifty percent of the parcels in the channel district. Mm -hmm. And the reason fifty five, yeah. So I mean oh, it's right around but, the so, but, more. but there the reason that the channel district was created by a state bill and there's a code in the state Public safety laws or health and safety code. Health, there's a code in the self and Haiti code, code that establishes the the Atherton Channel District because it is composed of different jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Are there parcels in Woodside? That's part there's of three yes. acres in mm -hmm. so so just sort of the highest level <coughs> assessment of what's in the district. <coughs> and it may have changed because I may, there may have been some articles that came out that I didn't get. But um, at the time that it was established, there were 30 acres in Woodside. Uh, there was Atherton between Atherton Avenue and the southern Atherton County uh, uh, city line. <coughs> and there was what they call an island uh, between uh, Watkins and Ensenal. El Camino and the tracks. And that was an island of unincorporated property then. And there was huge battles with, um, with Menlo Park residents and county residents. The county residents were uh, west of Alameda. And this was before the Marsh Road annexation. Uh, and um, and the Menlo residents were between Atherton Avenue and Valparaiso. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Camino uh, de los Cerros, yeah. that, that whole area, and, and, and also uh, uh, closer to Valparaiso. That yeah. would, like Frank's Lane and those other yeah, little, in there. Yeah. And, and there. anyway, it, the history was tortured, and there were, it took years and years and years to get this thing settled. And ultimately it got settled because the Atherton Council agreed to allow those re residents, which I think was about 2,000 acres, it was almost half of the district, um, west of Alameda not to join it. And then they had enormous floods right after they decided not to join it, and they ultimately joined it. But so, we can't assess them. Well, they're in the district right now, right now, I think. They're, they're in the, the district, district now. Assessment. But if we're going to go ahead and make an extra assessment, if I remember the meeting that we had, he said it would be very difficult for us to impose an additional tax on Memo Park that they would have to vote themselves that tax. Well, and, and that's uh, to add to the existing assessment. There could this be year. a combination of things, yeah. too, right? You could, it doesn't have to be only one, one tool. We could use possibly two of, two of these. Shall I quickly go through? Because yeah. I think it will help to kind of compare and contrast I'm these. I'm Thank you for doing that. Sorry. Well, that's I don't no, no, need to it, but no, 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 to put this in the context of that history and, and this it's district is, I think, Proposition really. Proposition 13 created a lot of interesting, yeah, anachronistic stuff because it froze things in time, right? So you have areas that have developed extensively since then, but they only get the tiny share of the tax 
for mm -hmm. example, you know, with fire districts or, or water districts or other special purpose things where now they have you know, 100,000 people and in 1978 there may have been nobody there. So it's created a lot of sort of set in stone things. So anyways, assessment districts, we have to look at benefit. We can't just create like a parcel tax and I'll talk about that in a minute. The way you approve an assessment district is you mail a ballot to the property owners. So we don't talk to registered voters in this example. And it's a ballot process. It's not, I'm not an attorney, but it's a, But it's a ballot seven. process, is that the 218? It's not an election. It is subject to 218, correct. And you mail out basically ballots to everybody in that assessment district where you draw the boundaries. It could be the channel district itself. Um, and then you wait to get those back and you tabulate them as a protest ballot. So you're looking for a no to get to a yes, if that makes sense. So you mail out 100 ballots and you only get three back. If two say yes and one say no, green light. If two say no and one say yes, red light. You can't form the district for a year. I'm sorry, go back. To, what's, what's the concept of a protest ballot? What does that refer to? Um, How is it different from just a regular? Yeah. It's based on, um, one, it's the value of the assessment. So if you're assessed $2 Wait. and you're assessed $1, you actually have two votes and you have uh, one vote. So again, the protest, is, again, protest refers to what? You, you, are, you get a ballot and you can choose to mail it back or not. You can say, I protest it or I support. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a real sort of arcane. Okay. And, and the failure to vote is? The failure to vote is no vote. It's it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. But if you if you want it to pass, you want your proponents to mail in your ballot because that's it's literally yeah it's only ones that come back. So I'm sorry it, you mentioned this, but it's it's weighted. Does that mean let's say how many homes are there in the in the district? Do we know? By the amount of the assessment. So if you have a two acre parcel, then we assess a hundred dollars. And you have a, par uh, a one acre parcel that we assess fifty dollars. Again, you have two votes for every every one. That's wow. an example. And it takes us a month to count a regular election with a thousand people in it. So this will take you know, an Excel spreadsheet. We've yeah. tabulated yeah, thousands of them. So you just you have to barcode them, and you can you can get through them pretty quickly. Yeah. But the, when you're sending out the ballot, do you? Do you tell them you're being assessed because, and here's the reason why? Oh yeah. And okay. It's a very transparent process. They can the engineer's report would be on file here and on your website, and you know, so people would people would know what you know what they're asked to but, protest or not. <laughs> but we need, but we need to go out and do an assessment of each property. It can't be something as simple as, or can it be as simple as you have you know, a two acre versus a one acre. Doesn't it have to do with the- It's a, de I would call it an, a, a desktop kind of assessment. It's not like we have to go out and inspect every single property and, you know, measure out what kind of trees you have and that kind of thing. I mean, it's, you can look at impervious, you can look at size, you can look at slope, you can look at use, you can look at a bunch of different things depending on what the exact assessment is so going to be So we would have for. to develop that Yes. Okay, and then then apply it to each piece of property. Correct. And and yeah, we, you know we've done it for large large areas, right? You you can you can do it with different uh, analytical methods. You don't have to again. You don't have to inspect each and every property. Well, I, I think about this in the context of what we did a couple years ago on Marsh Road because there we have a project that. Let's say, say it cost four million dollars, and let's say there was some amount that was in the channel district account. I think we used 100 percent of that, but the cost was more than the channel district had funds. So if at that point we had said, well, the additional three and a half million dollars, it's really not the responsibility of the town; it's the responsibility of the channel district. So let's send out a ballot to the channel district members and tell them what the assessment would be. And so that three and a half million would be divided between the 2,000 members based on some benefit analysis, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the vote came back 50% or more against than in favor based on the weighting that you're describing, 
then they, that would not authorize the tax, right? Correct. And in that case, then what would I mean? Then then they would have maybe liability if the road if we just let the road cave in. I, that yeah, that's another. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'm legal question at that point. I'm yeah. thinking that there's. There, I mean, we felt a responsibility to take care of it because the road was, we were told by engineers, the road was going to cave in. Yeah. Uh, and, but in reality, it might have been more the responsibility of the channel district than of the city council. So we didn't really do that assessment. But looking forward, where we have issues that we need to do in the channel, we. As, we yeah, assessment we, districts have done, you know, street improvements, water. Wastewater, like neighborhoods that have been on septic that's failing, and they all want to hook up to a sewer system. You can do an assessment district, right? Or you can do Burlingame Avenue, right? The redo of Burlingame Avenue that was funded uh, a third of it by an assessment district that all the properties along downtown Burlingame Avenue pay for. So it's it really does a lot of. You can do a lot of different things. It just depends on do you have that, you know, majority you, approval to, to do it. We would not, this would not apply to something, and we have a process to do beforehand versus doing the repair like a failure. We were reacting to a failure. We can't go back and say we want to. No, this is a more methods. proactive, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's a so proactive it's approach. And if we were to do it, then it would also cover Menlo Park and Portola Valley and things like that. We'd be sending them all ballots. Right. Yeah, the yeah, idea yeah, 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 you do it around the district, district boundaries. Yeah. And they would have that weighted vote. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of the water that goes in there mm -hmm. is from all this new develop a lot of new development or the development that has been done recently, maybe not current current, but it's you know then there's just you mean residential development residential or? development and the development that they've done along El Camino. You know, it's it's Tremendous amount of water that goes into those those storm drains that go into the channel. So just to put a bow on the assessment district again, I mentioned infrastructure. It can be used for ongoing maintenance, that kind of thing. It, literally everything from business improvement districts to, like I mentioned, Burlingame Avenue streetscape to uh, infrastructure can be part of an assessment district. Now to kind of juxtapose that with a parcel tax. And a CFD is a, is a version of a parcel tax. There you're not constrained to that exact metric of impervious surface or runoff or whatever. You, you come up with something that's reasonable and meets the goal of what you're trying to do. That could be a per acre charge. That could be linear frontage. You, know, you come up with a formula that's simple enough that you can explain to people, of course, mm -hmm. and, and, and make sure that you're trying to get to where you need to go. Now, the important part of this, though, is that this doesn't involve that protest ballot that we talked about a minute ago, but rather, this does go to the registered voters. And at this point, we're having a sidebar, but at this point, in my opinion, it's still a two-thirds voter approval is required for a parcel tax. There's a whole bunch of constitutional amendments that have been floating around to, to drop the two-thirds to something lower than that, but they're, they haven't gotten traction yet. Uh, quick question. So. Here is registered voters. On the assessment, it's just property it's just property, property owners. So right. whether they're registered or not. Right. Yes. We're very different. Well, I, when, I'm, I'm, property I'm, owners. I'm sorry. So if I'm a foreign national, mm. uh, I live in China. I own the property. Mm. Do I vote? No. With an assessment district, you would get a ballot, and you certainly can respond. Um, but with a registered voter not vote, absolutely. No, no, not, not a CFD. Okay, I, you can't I, vote. I, I'm stunned that you can a foreign national can can vote in any of these. I didn't realize that. Well, again, a, an assessment district is not a vote. Oh, it's that's not that's subject that's to the elections code. Oh, oh that's right. It, that's the support thing or the yeah. protest thing. Or the yeah, it's literally it's a it's just a pro, it's an administrative process. It's not an election, so it doesn't matter. To my knowledge, it doesn't matter where you're from. You could be from Mars or whatever. You get a protest ballot and you fill it out. Uh, Tim, um, through sorry, the Atherton Channel District is a subsidiary district under the law, I think, not a, 
a basic not an independent special district. Not an independent special right. district. Does do you know if it has the legal authority to be able to do a parcel tax or things like that? Special districts are unique. Yes, we would have to double check on if it has the authority to do a parcel tax. However, I'm almost certain we don't want to check the legal box that it could do a CFD though, okay. which is I know kind of strange, but. Yeah, the parcel tax is 50075, and it says cities and counties may do this, but some special districts have it in their authority. So and yeah. I don't know that today. We would definitely figure that out. Yeah, but a CFD is, is, is definitely a possibility. Again, CFDs have been around since 1982. They're super popular. They're all, you know, they're all over the place. And what about the new, um, the new one that's come up under the law, the IF? CD. Oh, the EIFD? EIFD, yes. Huh, that's an interesting one. Um, I mean, that's an, that's an enhanced infrastructure financing district. I don't, do you know offhand how much, well, but you'd have to give up your tax increment. Yeah, that, that's the issue is that you have, I mean, the tax I'm increment that the district get itself gets isn't very much. No, you know. yeah. And you're not going to siphon off part of the town's right. taxes to do well, it. we wouldn't want to do that, right? There's been a lot of people who were all excited about EIFDs when they came yeah. out, and frankly, a handful of communities can really leverage it because they don't get enough of that 1%. Right. Interesting, East Palo Alto, though, gets like 33 cents of the dollar, so they actually could do something with it. Yeah. But generally, most cities just don't get it. Yeah, can't schools anyway, so yeah. Yeah, and, and the schools can't participate exactly. Unless you have a partner that's willing to give something up. Yeah. yeah. So CFDs, anyways, I mentioned all the sort of things. So here's the one that's the kind of that weird one that lives in the middle. So if an assessor district is here and a, and a parcel tax or CFD is here, the property related fee thing is kind of in the middle, right? And that's again what Palo Alto did. You may be familiar. They have a property related fee for storm drain. Burlingame has one. Rancho Palos Verdes in Southern California had one. They, they didn't renew it. But it, it's subject to approval by either the property owners or you can go to an election. So it's, it's really an odd sort of hybrid. Um, you, if you, um, the important thing is you have to do what I would kind of jokingly refer to as an assessment engineering light process. You have to prove proportionality, but you don't have to prove special benefit, which is a higher legal hurdle to jump over. So in other words, you need to come up with some kind of ratio to, to apportion out the costs of the project, whatever that project is going to be, and have a rational method for doing that. And then you have this protest ballot <laughs> process that's actually one parcel, one vote, so it's not weighted any longer. But you would, if you had 100 properties in the district, you mail out 100 ballots and you wait to see what comes back and they're just equal. Or if you don't want to talk to the property owner, if you want to go to the voters, you could go down the, the registered voter vote, but there you needed two thirds. So you're right back to where you started from. So the real reason to do a property related fee, in my opinion, is if you were gonna mail out ballots to the property owners and you have a fair and transparent process of what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, and so that would be the, the vehicle to do it. And you obviously have to explain it and you know, you have a, obviously a, an astute audience that you're talking to, um, and, you, and you are in charge of that process because you're mailing the ballots as to when you want to. You can set up proper education and community meetings, whatever, you know, makes sense. So it's, there's, there's some nuances that we can discuss if you want to get real granular, but in, in essence, you, it's this, um, you know, mail ballot process or the voters, and there's a lot of different examples out there. And I did put on here the Palo Alto that I already mentioned. But just as an aside, I don't want to get way down in legal discussion now, but if there was a reason to form like a county service area, because I know you're overlapping jurisdictions, the CSA could actually also try it for a property related fee, but you'd have to create another district, if you will, a county service area. So it may not maybe a non-starter, but I wanted to at least throw that out there in case somebody was um, thinking about that. I think that is my 10, yeah, that's my 10 one. So 
Um, I, I, I tried to cover most of the questions that Robert forwarded me, but. I just have a yes. question. I, I missed the uh, difference between water supply versus environmental or regulatory needs. Mm. How, what is that differential? So there have been some legislative changes and such to where some, there's a few people running around saying you can do a property related fee for stormwater without going to the to a vote of the property owners. There's been some laws changed. So in other words, you would treat it like water, sewer, trash. But for what I understand your needs are, you're not in that bucket. So in other words, if we were in you know, a rural community and we pumped all our groundwater out of the ground, and we were adding to the supply by taking stormwater and putting it back in the ground, then you could put this fee forward as if it was like a water fee. In other words, for water supply. And that wouldn't need an approval process. You wouldn't have to go to the voters or the property owners. But for your purposes, I don't believe that's anywhere. There's a Senate Bill 231 and a whole bunch of stuff, but I think it's totally tangential. <laughs> you may have heard about it because Salinas was slapped with a Mm -hmm. a lawsuit that tried to do this a few years ago, so mm -hmm. I didn't even want to get into that yeah, because it's murky. Order of magnitude, have we talked about how much money we would like to generate? We looked to Yeah, when well, we did the uh, drainage master plan, we at one with one of these meetings we segregated <coughs> yeah. the projects that were within the channel district. I thought it was like four to seven million dollars worth, but I'm not sure. Over whatever the time period is back on the total. Right. Right. No, the yeah. low hanging fruit versus and the high. Those are capital projects. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and we're getting about 84,000, about right. $10,000 delta between right. where, where revenue is about 84,000 and, and maybe it's about 74,000 or 73,000 or something. Yeah, so I mean the money's well, not well, there for major well, well, projects well, and that 75, kind of thing. 75,000 was for the water, water capture, capture project. Yeah. In fact, mm -hmm. we do that. And we um, only sp expend maybe how much on the frog issue? Maybe ten thousand a year. Uh, we have two annual reports that we're doing, so that's about ten or fifteen grand. And then, but we have other we, other things like you know we do cleaning of the mm -hmm. channel and minor repairs, but we don't have the funds to do. You know the the channel's rather old, and you know parts of it are starting to fail. You know, well, gonna well, gonna get to the point where they're gonna so fail. We're gonna have to start dealing with relining certain areas as time goes on. Um, and so this was, you know, the, the idea is looking forward, how is it that we could fund um, both ongoing maintenance as costs go up, as well as addressing some of those capital needs. So you could, again, I mentioned earlier, you could do a combination of two things. And I know, obviously, this could maybe be complicated, <coughs> or you'd have, obviously, maybe some voter fatigue, if you want to call it that. But you could, as the town, put a parcel tax out there, you know, pick a number, $75 a year per parcel or something for the ongoing maintenance, and spread it all over the town if there was a real nexus there. And then you could do a fee for just the drainage district to do some kind of capital that would have a period of, you know, repayment of 20 years or whatever, whatever it might be. So you, there is kind of a mix and match that you could could do here. If you follow Palo Alto, they actually had a very interesting way they did it. They approved two different fees. One has a sunset because it's only for capital, and then the other one goes on, you know, longer for, for operations and maintenance. And that's what their Blue Ribbon Committee, you know, really gathers the input from the community and sort of tried to figure out what, what the community would bear. If we, if we look at those two buckets, I'm still a little confused. Now I understand sort of the capital component, which is somewhere in the ballpark of $7 million, right? What, it, what's the operational, estimated operational cost over the course of the year? Is it less than $70,000? Currently. Yeah, yeah, currently it is. And if we did the, the additional projects, would it go up dramatically? Or would well, it be? One, one example would be if we did the water capture project, that maintenance alone would be about 75000 a year. Okay, and so it really depends on what other things get added in. You know, we're going to start entertaining the conversation of green infrastructure, what that looks like. And as we do that, there are costs associated with it, whether it's the capital cost, 
the irrigation on you know to for plant establishment or the maintenance of the facilities that get installed as part of that if the town were to take those items on and so you have the the routine costs that we're doing now you know clearing out debris from the channel um, you know which is what we're doing in our current maintenance functions it's then depending on what projects we implement if those add additional maintenance costs or not. Mm -hmm. Isn't this a little bit like we're trying to be a proactive approach so we have That's more correct. variable options, for example, like the channel. We could have, if we had something in play already, we could have been able to utilize funds because we had an analysis that said that this would be a potential failure, therefore we would have a pot of revenue. We have $46 million in that drainage master plan that you know we have no idea how to fund it, and the short term is you know $7 million or such. But with more options on the table, it gives us more flexibility because the lead time to get to some of this revenue source is a year or more. I, it's forty-six million yeah. in, the, in the drain yeah. master plan. Yeah. yeah, in total. Yeah. But, yeah. but there's if you did everything all at once. And yeah, but there's also an assessment as to whether or not some of that is we talked about. Some of that may be the owner's responsibility as opposed to the town's responsibility. Yeah. So we need to do more refinement. Yeah. But there's a lot of it that's would be the town, but maybe at least 30 million. <laughs> <laughs> well, throw, throw a number out there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you don't know. Yeah, we did a culvert up on Bellbrook, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. a couple years ago. And wasn't there, in the last year, there, there was a culvert at Marsh? Uh, mm -hmm. I know, I, I don't know if we've done that one yet, but. At Marsh? On, on, sorry, not on Marsh, on Walsh. Uh, in the flat area yeah. of Mont yeah. Walsh. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if we did that, but the, the property owner had complained about it, and I know we looked at it. When we did the culvert on Bellbrook, did we pay for that out of general funds? Uh, I think that was a remnant of the parcel tax. Plus we have a parker. So that, that's essentially general funds. Yeah, right. Plus we have a no, parker and special. Yeah. special. No, but uh, I mean, yeah. special tax, but yes. from the town as a whole yes. yeah. versus from the, anything the from district. channel district. Yeah, we have yes. a because we've been going to general fund for it. Yes, we've been doing it out of the general fund. Yeah, we've been doing it out of the parcel tax yes. for yes. roads and drainage repairs. Yes. And the failure of the parcel tax in 2016 was, is a, it's a big loss. It's a, it's a big loss. I mean, it wasn't something that was ever going to fund the $44 million, but it really at least kept some of these projects going. Because it was, it was almost $2 million, $1.8 I mean, just coming in for 40 years. <laughs> like, anyway, so um, to be able to re, uh, start something like that and have that additional funds, I and mean, we really get an earmark for these kinds of projects. I think we need to think about trying to go back to the voters for that. But getting the two thirds is is hard, um, and because um, because we got fifty percent, we just didn't get two thirds. Uh, one uh, one additional layer to that is uh, with the Appleton Channel District. If you make an assessment and it's you know one hundred fifty two hundred bucks a parcel, whatever that is, you're not going to get to those large numbers right. really quickly. Right. So That's the way true. that you do projects. Against it, mm -hmm. or against it. Yes. Is there a time set if, in fact, you do a draw with parcel tax component but dedicated revenue source towards drainage solely? Is there a time frame of 50, 20 year, 10 year, whatever? Is there, or is that just in the language as it's written? Mm -hmm. It's whatever people will approve. Yeah, I mean, you could be in perpetuity, it could be 25 years, it mm -hmm. could be. We have a perpetuity year. problem. No. So, mm -hmm. I yeah, mean, I think it'd be hard to go to the voters too, unless we, unless we said this is exactly what we're going to do with these funds. Yes, and, and that that's part of the education process. Mm -hmm. So, so the purpose of this was first off to get educated, but then also to give some direction or how we would like to move forward. So, I guess what type of direction or comments are you specifically looking? I think that's correct. It was to, to bring the expert in the room to help the okay. educate around this. We'll come back uh, with a couple of narrowed options and suggestions to move forward. You don't need to make that decision okay. tonight. I almost feel like we have a cart and horse issue here, yeah. though, because we got to figure out what we want to 
do? And are, are we shooting at a $40 million target over 10 years? Are we shooting at a $7 million target? You know, mm -hmm. And that, I think, would, I assume, have a big influence on what we decided to do. Right. We'll bring the drainage master plan. I yeah, we need to narrow yeah. that yeah. list down for you. Yeah. And, then and we'll what's, what's, what's facing us in critical right. uh, time frames? Yeah, we have a few. We do. Okay. Yeah. Which we had to Probably do. like next week, given the weather, you know? <laughs> 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 okay. Has uh, anybody taken the Phil Lively tour up, um, with all the rain? Remember? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go up yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and watch the channel rage. Yeah. Have you done that? We could go over to Steve Noshheim's house and yeah, stand yeah. at his backyard, right? Watch our turtles and watch down. the tree or come down. Turn frogs go down. Mm -hmm. I think it's, any of us that ever tried to pound the signs into the ground here oh, no. realizes, okay. you know, <laughs> how that water, like near your house, there's water going to be sitting for till August or something, until it dries up. You know, <laughs> it's not going to percolate. That's for sure. No, it runs down and it goes into the, the storm drain on El Camino. There you go. And fortunately, it doesn't flood like. And where do you think that storm drain? Like the north. Nowhere. The bayfront, no way. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So nice segue. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, it, we should probably move on then to the. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Seven, yeah. Six or seven copies of that. So oh, you're, you're having trouble sleeping. Sure. member that has a personal commitment and is going to be leaving uh, in 20 minutes. So, so I'm just not to take any of this personal <laughs> stuff. Unless you're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got some personal. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So, oh, so right if, but if people have to get up and leave, we we'll still have three because we really want to hear what you have to say. Absolutely. But don't be insulted. No. They had prior commitments. Great. Okay. Well, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Larry Patterson. Uh, until the end of last calendar year, I was the city manager in San Mateo. I have uh, retired in December. Uh, I was the co-chair with my colleague of the staff advisory team, which supported the CCAG as the countywide uh, water coordination committee. And so in that role, the county asked me if I would continue to go out to the communities as we start to roll this proposal out and explain kind of where it came from and what it's about. And what it might do for the county uh, in the area of uh, flooding and sea level rise and regional stormwater projects, which you've now had kind of a warm up exercise for that with the previous presentation. Um, the, what I'd like to do is cover a little bit about why the agency is needed, um, the key, key aspects of the proposal. Uh, if you have specific questions, I'm happy to go into more detail. Talk, talk about the startup schedule, uh, funding of the, the startup, which is what we're talking about uh, tonight, is just uh, uh, the effort required to establish um, the agency and what it's ultimately going to do and how it will ultimately be funded. So and then I'll talk about, yes. Yeah. So uh, as you're getting into the beginning, though, there was a ballot measure just a year or two ago. All the counties around the Bay voted to fund, I believe it passed, to fund sea level rise. And so you could maybe talk to us about where that money has gone or is going and how that applies to the money that you're thinking you're going to raise for this project. Right. I, I suspect that was probably measure AA, I think it was a regional yeah, measure. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll come back and just talk a little bit about that because it fits into the same category as other potential funding sources to the state or the federal government. And that is that the county is not well organized to pursue that kind of funding because we don't as the, again, kind of, kind of pivot off of Tim's comments, uh, we don't have a clear idea countywide of what the program really needs to be, uh, and therefore it's difficult. And when cities are going individually after projects, it's not the same as having a Santa Clara Valley Water District or a, a Contra Costa District going after funding. They have more weight. They can do more in uh, Sacramento about forming and shaping the legislation than we can at this point because we're all operating kind of independently disaggregated way. So I'll come back to that a little bit, 
but it's at the heart of what we're trying to do uh, with this proposal. Yeah, but my only comment was that there is money being taken out of our taxes and going into some fund along with money from every other county and somebody's spending it. Yes. And a lot of that is Bay Restoration work, I believe. And, and with me tonight is Jim Porter, who's already I, spoken to you. And, I'm also, and Eric um, Powell. So, uh, Eric right. Powell, I'm uh, actually spoken to you before. Um, but I'm on the advisory committee for the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority. Um, this measure a advisory committee. So um, if you have any questions, I could talk about that. Um, but uh, yes, so projects are being uh, funded. This is for restoration along the shoreline. So that they're really focused on restoration along the shoreline. Um, wetlands restoration that's going to help mitigate some of the sea level rise impacts. But um, as you know, that's not going to be the only answer. There's going to need to be a hybrid approach to addressing sea level rise. Yeah. And it puts, uh, this, uh, the proposal we're talking about puts us in a better position to pursue that kind of funding when we have kind of comprehensive plan within the county. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about where we are with the endorsements of this proposal and then um, mm -hmm. just summarize the action that we're requesting ultimately from the town I understand. This is just an informational and formal meeting, uh, but I'll uh, describe what we're asking of each of the agencies within the county. Um, first of all, uh, property impacts, uh, and I think the staff report did a good job of describing just the magnitude of the property impacts uh, that are really uh, at risk with sea level rise. Uh, and we struggle with sea level rise because when we were talking about 2050 or 2100, sometimes that seems like a long way away. But the reality is the impacts are going to be significant. And the second goal being that the, the actual funding required for those, the kinds of projects that will be needed to mitigate the sea level rise and flooding issues within the county are very large and generally multi-jurisdictional. They don't conform to city boundaries very well. Um, I think we've, as I mentioned earlier, we've been at a disadvantage in pursuing um, uh, grants. Uh, uh, Erica Powell has been active with some of the MOU projects in pursuing grant funding um, and deals a lot with the Corps of Engineers and others who will tell you up front that it is better to come in as a countywide program than it is as individual cities. Um, the existing flood control district, which does exist and will become part of this proposal, uh, is really countywide, but it's focused in three primary zones. And Jim Porter would be in a better position to answer some of the specifics about that. But that's one of those pre-Prop 13 um, agencies set up in 1950-ish, and um, and that it still exists and has ongoing work. And then. Uh, I think one of the things that's here, and I, I'm gonna, I, I really meant at, at Robert's urging to add a little bit to this bullet that I didn't, and that is that uh, we have coming down to the local jurisdiction significant requirements from the Regional Water Quality Control Board about stormwater uh, retention, stormwater quality, and it's going to be very difficult for each city to try to pursue what they need to do to meet those requirements within their own boundaries. And one of the uh, I think opportunities with this proposal is to actually look at it again as a county as a whole so that these large projects could actually be counted as benefits towards some of the cities where it's not located but actually are participating as part of this overall program. Uh, and that's conversations that I think Matt Fabry's been having with the Regional Water Quality Control Board staff. Um, I think uh, the part I didn't add is that we went out and talked with uh, agency staff and elected officials um, as part of the development of this proposal. And one thing we heard at every meeting was this needs to include maintenance because it is one of the most difficult things <coughs> for uh, agencies to do. And it just with the example that Robert gave where it can double your maintenance costs just by having one facility kind of added in in terms of the added cost. And these facilities are not very well uh, centered in one location. They're going to be scattered around the county and have some special maintenance needs that are currently not within anyone's budget at the local level. Uh, the process we went through is uh, CCAC set up a standing committee uh, to look at uh, countywide water coordination. Uh, <coughs> that committee then asked to have a group of uh, staff folks uh, get together and help develop the proposal. There are about 18 members to that uh, team. That was the one that Matt Callig and I chaired. And then uh, we worked with uh, Environmental Science Associates, CSA, to develop um, uh, the proposal and also to coordinate the outreach to the various agencies about what we were doing. Uh, the CCAG board and the board of supervisors have now both endorsed the proposal. 
uh, CCAG did at their uh, January 10th meeting and the Board of Supervisors at, I think it was the January 29th meeting. The proposal itself, uh, you have, I think, copies uh, that were provided. Uh, uh, there's the proposal and then there is the executive summary. Um, and the executive summary being more graphic and kind of a summary, obviously, things that are in the larger proposal. Um, but those two documents are really the product out of the staff advisory team and the, the water coordination, kind of our water coordination committee. Uh, here's the basics of the proposal. One is that uh, we, we tried and talked about a number of different ways of forming it, but the one that seemed to make most sense was to take the flood control district that currently exists and some of its functions would make sense within this new agency and simply through legislation modify it. The modifications would include uh, change in the governance structure. One of the things we heard back when we went out to the uh, agency meetings uh, was uh, feeling that these functions really should not just be in the hands of board supervisors, but should be in a, a committee comprised or a board comprised of both city members and and the county members. So there'd be two board of supervisors members, one of them from District 3, which would be the coast side, and the uh, other five members would be four kind of geographically north, central, south, coast, plus one at large. Uh, those would be appointed, uh, elected officials appointed by the CCAG board. And would they, the would they rotate, or are they just permanent positions given to specific towns? They would have terms, um, but uh, but there's, there's a balance. Uh, this work is going to be fairly technical, and one of the things that came through in talking about it is a need to have some continuity on this board. So <coughs> the idea would be that members could participate uh, for an extended period of time to try to bring that continuity into this process, but clearly they would have set terms and would be sequenced so that they don't all expire at the same time. Um, and I think the, that's a part of the, the, the detail that we'll still be working out as we can move forward with the legislation that's going up to Sacramento. So, so Larry, just to, some feedback for you. Um, you know, we as a small town seem to find that we don't get any people on any of the big boards, all the big towns do, and we think that, you know, when we pay our fair share, that maybe that should be changed. So I, I, I would encourage you as you're making a governance that there would be some rotation uh, so that all towns would actually have an opportunity to yep. get on it, and at least on a two-year basis. I, I agree with you. I understand, having served on other boards, that, that uh, yeah, you, you got to really know the process, and it takes a year or so. But um, honestly, uh, Atherton, and I hear it from my colleagues, that, you know, we get shut out of a lot of things where I think that we actually would add a heck of a lot of value and we add a perspective, uh, you know, representing some smaller jurisdictions, as does the borough and things like that, well, we normally don't get any of those positions as well. Yeah, and I'll carry that back as we talk more about it and we talk more about the specific of the legislation that would establish this agency. Um, I think it's, uh, I think that's been discussed by CCAG, uh, because it started off, I think, as a, a six-person committee that ended up an eight-person committee, and the two additions were small cities, like Portola Valley and Woodside, I think, were the two that added in. And so uh, the idea was that they had been kind of overlooked in the process and didn't want to be overlooked again. The Coastside has the same issue. They're concerned that when you have Facebook on your shoreline, it's a lot different than having erosion on a, you know, an apartment building in Pacifica. It, and so there is a real need to try to establish this. It was one of the reasons why the selection process was moved to CCAG as opposed to the City Select Committee. With the original proposal, or subposal was, well, what about using the City Select Committee? And there wasn't the sense that that was going to provide the, that type of geographic and si equity among the cities and the continuity that was needed. So, so that's where we ended up, and I, th I think that message is clear, but I'll reinforce it when we go back and talk. Yeah, and one of the other things in looking at the proposal and what you've put together in the staff report, um, you know, we keep approving more and more development right on the bay line, on the shoreline. We've been talking for years about sea level rise. When are we gonna have a countywide ordinance that says that if you're, if you're building on the, on the bay front, you need to build your levee. Why, why do we allow, 
and, you know, and I would hope that this group would look into that is to say, okay, we need to have an ordinance that says that if you're building a big Facebook multi-million dollar thing, you need to protect your own, right. your area. You've got to, you know, contribute to it because today maybe that property is worth a million, but after we do all this levy and everybody else pays for it, now it's worth 20 million. Okay, so they've been enriched by by all the residents, and it's, it's not. I realize it's got to be a general thing, but at the same time, it also needs to be fair. No, I, I, and I agree, and I think the, the some of the conversation on that. First of all, if you're in a flood map, you 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 have to meet requirements to be able to develop. So you're not free to develop uh, down in the flood plain itself. You mm -hmm. have to build above it, or you have to. Um, uh, provide some other mitigation. It's difficult to have uh, individual projects fund levies because levies need to be continuous and long. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for example, in San Mateo, we, we uh, the first levy project was done, and it it had a whole variety of different funding sources. Uh, Seven and a half million was from an assessment district, uh, but but the the total was probably three times that. Uh, the North Shoreview is about three times that as well. Well, there are no single developments that come in. Well, I heard numbers from Stanford being another issue, but, the, but to be able to really fund that kind of a project. So you want to make sure they pay it their share, but you have to also recognize the broader community interest and blend it with some other broader funding mechanism, including grants, right. uh, to try to get the projects done. But, but I think that when we talk about the, this concern, there's this concern about local control and taking land use authority away from the cities. And there was pretty strong messages back to us that, that wasn't what anybody wanted, but that they would like to have better information upon which to do the, your general plan. So that, that this agency could could say, well, you have 2100 flooding is likely to be within this range. Our recommendation to you as a, a town council is we recommend that you work with this number as the best estimate we have today, and then that could be updated as things move forward, but not to dictate where you can build and where you can't build. Right, so just one other, one last comment, and then we'll go with you. Uh, and so you, you did point out something that I spoke to our city manager about, too. And, and, and I appreciate you bringing it up as opposed to me, but okay, so we are going to have levy projects here in San Mateo County. Don't you think the water will come up from San, Santa Clara and flood us or come down from San Francisco? This is more of a regional problem, which is why I think that AA proposal that was gonna fund all these things, it was gonna have a, it was, it was marketed as we're going to build levees and protect from, as a, as a region, we're going to address the regional problem because it is a regional problem. It's not a county problem, it's a regional problem. And so, you know, Menlo Park will get flooded from Santa Clara if they don't do anything. And so, I, I guess one of the things is that if you go through that, I'd, I'd like to understand really how all this stuff goes together, but okay, I took it's, up enough time, so. If I could, just a quick, quick yeah, answer to your, your comment is that, um, that today it would be very difficult to try to coordinate with Santa Clara County given how we go about our flood control and sea level rise decision making. The closest we have is the San Francisco Creek, which has some Santa Clara and some uh, San Mateo involvement. But the reality is uh, we need to have our act together, much like uh, Santa Clara County has with their uh, Santa Clara Valley Water Edition. That's not what we're trying to duplicate here, but in, it, in fact, to have those conversations or to have that same conversation with the San Francisco Airport or to have it with San Francisco, the city and county of, we need to have the kind of organization we're talking about here to have a meaningful conversation and make any progress. That's kind of the thought process. Okay. So, so my Sorry. concern, and maybe you touched upon it, is, is um, it more relates to local control and local government. And, and I see a lot of things coming at us that are, are sort of these, in my view, unaccountable regional entities that exist or special districts that exist. Um, and I do believe they're politically unaccountable. They're just, and they're making decisions for, for the towns. And then we've got other issues coming now with housing that we may be required to provide that will be taken out of our control and stuff like that. Um, and, and as I think about this issue, which is an important issue, one of the concerns I have is Almost everything we do can be tied to sea level rise. You know, exhaling can be tied to sea level rise. And, and, and I worry very much that once we create an entity, it, could, it, it has the ability to become this behemoth that just 
dictates control over every, everybody else pretty easily, and that it could happen despite everybody's best intentions because the mission is so important. So have you thought about, are there any steps in here that, that really constrain the ability of this group to make decisions? It's, it says that you'll be addressing permitting, for example, as example in our well, that, that so I'd like to know what, what you know, and I mean real structural stuff to make sure that, it, apologize for blunt language, that we keep it in a box as opposed to letting it just yeah. grow to this thing that essentially usurps mm -hmm. all our authority. Well, the, the permit reference is really to assist cities in getting the permits because most cities don't have staff that deal with the permitting agencies on a regular basis. Okay. So it was more of an assistance to the cities to get the permits you But need. more broadly, me, sir, could, but, my concern, you know, yeah. would you address yeah. that directly? And I, I think the, uh, you know, if you think about it, some of the things we're talking about with regional stormwater are really being uh, triggered by the Regional Water Quality Control Board. And, and so, so that's a good example of an unaccountable entity that, that <laughs> has tremendous power that nobody knows what they do really. And yeah, I didn't mean to single them out. Suddenly you get attacks on your Yeah, So, so they, so they're, 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 and that's the, just take the example of the uh, Region Water Quality Control Board and the, what they're required for the stormwater quality and retention issues in the county. Major projects. Oh, there's tra the trash capture as well. Tens of millions of dollars in San Mateo. I know we were going to be uh, spending on those kinds of requirements. So, so you see that stuff coming. That's not going to stop. In fact, every time there's a permit issue, it gets more restrictive. Yeah. So, what what the proposal is is to get prepared to represent the cities, not to impose on the cities as these regional requirements or state requirements come forward uh, into San Mateo County. We don't have the ability to do that if we're not organized. The the Confidence and uh, uh, I guess the confidence in the ability of making sure this agency's powers are not unlimited probably is the area of the way that the existing flood control district uh, legislation is modified, and we're meeting uh, currently talking about exactly that. And there may be more information I could bring back later, but the the thought is that 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 the uh, that it, the, the, the since 1950, the flood control district didn't do what you're most concerned about. We're trying to start there and modify it so that the right things can be done, but not to superimpose a, an extra permit requirement or a, extra uh, requirements on the local jurisdictions. In fact, just the opposite, which is to get staff available and, uh, and be able to support them as they move forward and take a project into the permitting or the grant application process. Okay. And this is just my view. I want, I, I, so that's a real concern. And, and Erica, or Jim, I saw Erica, you were nodding your head. Is there anything you'd want to add? Or? We can take a while. Yeah, please. Erica is actually running um, our flood resiliency program. And we've got three projects. We call them MOU projects. Um, one is Bayfront Canal, which your town is a partner in. The other is Navigable Slough up in San Bruno, South City. And the other one is Belmont um, okay. okay. Creek, which we just had a meeting on this morning. Um, and the way we've been operating is um, we truly have collaborative partnerships with the city. So we're all in this together. In uh, Bayfront Canal, Robert is attending our meetings. All the cities that we work with are equal partners um, and provide feedback on the improvements. And I know you made it, and it's very ideal right now, right? It's we're all working together. Uh, we'd like to keep that, that um, method of operating, uh, if this district is created, for the projects that we'll be doing up on Bayshore, for instance. And you mentioned, um, well, so these are very expensive projects. And part of what Larry is gonna get to in a second is we're gonna try to speak as one county to be more eligible for federal grants because um, right now we're all competing against each other in San Mateo County for those grants. Um, but there is local match. And it's, I'm not sure if this agency will have the revenue to provide all the local match. So we want participation from the people that are receiving, the people, the jurisdictions that are receiving these um, improvements to not only have input in the design, um, but be an equal partner, because they're gonna inherit um, essentially this infrastructure and the improvements on them. And I'll give you an example. So we've been talking with Millbrae and Burlingame, because if you look at um, San Mateo, Coyote Point, Burlingame, Millbrae, SFO, there's a big area in there where there's no improvements. So Millbrae came to us and said, we'd really like to see some more um, pedestrian and bicycle opportunities along the bay, we don't have them, no connections. So we would work with Millbrae to make that happen and achieve those goals. But what we're gonna, what our goal is, is to, is to continue the good work that Eric is doing and work as partners as we move 
up and down the bay side and the coast side to try to make these improvements in. I don't know if I answered your question. I mean, does the charter constrain it to being a supporting agency, or is it, will it eventually become, does it have the ability to become directive over time? You know, I, I just don't see that happening here. So Santa Clara Valley Water District, everybody talks about them, the Golden Spade. So I don't think anybody wants to replicate that model. We want something more along the lines of the San Francisco Creek JPA, where they basically have five staff members working on these projects. What they do is they leverage the Santa Clara Valley Water District for technical support in San Mateo County and the cities. The engineers all get together and talk about these things, and, and in that case, Santa Clara took that project out of bid and constructed it. One of the things about San Mateo County is there's a lot of smaller cities, and they're not putting out extremely large projects on a regular basis. And part of what this agency will do is to get that expertise and develop those staff members so that they're fluent in delivering tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of projects along a bayfront, um, and really provide that expertise, but also leverage the city engineers to make sure that they're involved in these processes. I hope that answered that. Well, actually, it's not I, really, it was close. Yeah, I, no, I mean, my question was really but literally about the charter and the powers that they, they so seem to have, and it sounds like. So what Larry, what's gonna happen is we're gonna take, and I'm sort of jumping into Larry here, but um, we're gonna take the flood control district. It was created in 1959 by the Flood Control Act. It's in the water code of the state of California. We're gonna change the governing board to have um, a seven uh, member governing board, two board of supervisors, five city council members. And they will essentially be um, the policy and decision making body. So that group will have the authority to decide how many staff is coming in and what that charge is. So um, I think that will have the ability to really right size the organization, for a better word, and make sure it fits San Mateo County. But, uh, but I think your point, I guess, needs to be taken back because the more yeah. that the organizations see maintenance and operational responsibility over to this district for some of the facilities that are built. There is that danger that you guys ultimately yeah, take and, on more control. And, and our ability to control it normally yes. would be to back out, and we really can't if right. yeah, yeah, we don't have people anymore we've given it away. And it's, you right. know, yeah. I'll stop talking here. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry. so this has been a coalition of the willing. I like to call it a coalition of the willing. Oh, our MOUs <laughs> are coming in with people that want to work with us. We have not run into a situation where, let's say, Burlingame says, I just don't want to do this, you know? So, I mean, we would have to learn how to address those types of issues. We would work on either side of Burlingame, but eventually you're gonna have a gap in your, um, in your, um, what am I looking for? What's the word I'm looking for? Protection, you'll have a gap in the protection. I would imagine there might be some peer pressure from San Mateo and Millbury who are gonna get flooded by Burlingame not acting, to say, Burlingame, you might want to yeah. play with us here. But that would happen at a policy level and not a staff level. I'll, I'll shut up. Rick had a question. Uh, actually, two comments. Um, and they're fairly different. But the first one is uh, I understand flood control district has existed since the 50s, and there's some disappointment with how uh, effective it's been. Um, and we're now transforming that organization to take on one of the biggest challenges that we have as a county, given the demographics of this county have, having both the coast side and the bay side, and the amount of financial exposure that we face from sea level rise. So it's a really important issue for us to take on. I fully agree with that. I'd be much more interested in this if at the same time we were taking on the flood control in a serious way, which flood control is now totally localized, right? I mean, yeah, and perhaps I can talk again. Yeah, go ahead. So the, the district well, wait, let me just finish before yes, you answer. So you just sat through the discussion of the Atherton Channel District, and you see in that discussion that we face a big issue, which is you know, we're one of many creeks that flow into the bay. We'd like to clean up that water and manage that process, but we don't have a way to really get, I, I think effectively, the people who are parcel owners in that district to pay those costs. I, I don't know how we're gonna do it. I don't think we're gonna do it. 
And if we hadn't have put in, if we hadn't have stepped forward and borne the cost of fixing the channel to the benefit of those channel district parcel owners, uh, there I think there would have been a big liability there, and it probably would have been borne by a lot of people. But uh, um, I'd be much happier if this proposal were more comprehensive. I mean, I understand Mike's point about, you know, losing local control. And what I'm proposing would effectively mean we might lose more local control. But I frankly don't think we have the level of control we need to properly manage this flood control district. And it would be way better if the city, if the county were able to take that over. Um, just a bit of history on the County Flood Control District. It was formed in 1959, pre-Prop 13. And the way that the districts were formed, uh, in fact, all of them in the Bay Area were formed in the 50s, just about that time. Um, they were formed countywide, and I'll speak to San Mateo counties. The district is countywide, but there are watersheds that are, um, we consider subzones, that have generated revenue. So we've got three subzones, uh, Coma Creek, San Bruno Creek, and San Francisco Creek. The revenue that we receive from those um, subzones are parcel tax revenue from uh, prior to Proposition 13 going into place. So up in Coma Creek, we generate about 3.2, 3.3 million a year. San Bruno Channel is about 200,000 a year. San Francisco Creek is about 250 to 300,000 a year. That is all the revenue we have. And the reason why the district is ineffective is because we don't have a funding source. So um, we have used on Coma Creek, the way that we've done improvements up there is we've leveraged that three million a year uh, for debt service on bonds. So we've issued quite a few bonds up there to, to maintain and, and improve that channel. But you're right, you hit on a great point because the key to this uh, success of this agency is going to be long-term funding. And to take a step back, um, about three or four years ago, Supervisor Pine led an effort to try to develop a comprehensive water agency. We got feedback that perhaps we've, we've taken on more than we should. Um, Bosco was concerned about ground water management and water supply. There was just a bunch of issues that popped up. So we took a step back and Supervisor Pine noticed that there were certain regional flooding issues that just weren't being addressed. Uh, Bayfront Canal is a good one. Five cities drained into there. No one was taking the lead and Supervisor Pine wanted to get this going. And so that's when we created the Flood Resiliency Program. The board put $6.2 million towards working with the cities to work on these projects, and we've got these three MOU projects. If this agency is formed, I, I think that part of its charge will not only be sea level rise protection and coastal erosion, but also continuing to address these regional um, riverine flooding issues that really aren't being addressed right now. Um, a lot of these creeks are on, county, are on city borders. A lot of the creeks are borders. And so a lot of cities just haven't come together with the other cities to repair these things. They're very expensive projects, and frankly, the city staff members are very busy. They're just not doing this kind of work on a regular basis. And so what we're trying to do is to take a step back, really look at what's not being done in this county, and start addressing not only the sea level rise and erosion control protection on the shoreline, but also working with the cities to try to come up with solutions to their regional flooding projects pro problems. We did get feedback from the cities that they would prefer us not working on their localized storm drain systems, and totally understandable, um, local control. But I think the intent is to try to address the gaps that you pointed out from the flood control district. It's ineffective because there really is no funding sources to do things countywide, and it, it really mirrors the discussion you had on your channel district. It's the same, same concept. I'm sorry, Larry. No, this is good. So, so my second point yes. is a governance point. So you have set up the uh, board of the re-situated flood control district to be a seven-member board. And you chose for the five council members to be appointed by the CCAG board rather than the city select committee. Why did you do that? I, now, there may be people that are involved. I don't, I mean, I, Elizabeth might be yeah, she is. on CK, but um, I mean, most of us uh, uh, go on occasion to the 
city select committee process so i think that involves more people actually participating so there's more democracy at that level than there is from the ck board and i wonder where you went well there were there, when we talked about it we started with the recommendation to use the city select committee uh, that was changed at the direction of the the, the countywide water coordination committee uh, and that one thing the that the countywide water coordination that's that's the CCAG subcommittee on water that's that's who the staff advisory team was really reporting so, to so wait so you guys proposed the city select committee and the CCAG board said no it should be the CCAG no, we, board no we, we just went, went so the way it started we had it what I, I termed a supposal we basically put some of these concepts out just to let people push on them a little bit right well, part of the feedback we got was that uh, there was a uh, challenge between should we have a 21 member board on this new agency or should we have something smaller? And the idea of the CCAG board, 21 members, appointing the five city members that would represent the county from the city side was kind of that place that it arrived at. So it was really trying to balance keeping 21 cities involved, which is not always the case with city select committee, uh, and, and also then uh, trying to have a committee that's small enough that you can actually get some work done uh, at a fairly technical level. But to Rick's point, as well as Bill's point earlier, the board members are, in essence, it's a political role versus a member agency, and therefore a small jurisdiction like us in Colma and Hillsborough and others may never be on that board position role unless it's part of the process that when seven members, two of those membering cities have to be smaller jurisdictions there has to, because we're not Daly City, we're not San Mateo, so you know our issues to anybody else is, are you kidding? Yeah, but it's, uh, if it's South County, Woodside, Atherton, Portola Valley, just, we're not represented, it's Woodside or Menlo Park. Yeah, and, and but, but quite honestly, like just we just recently had an MTC vote, okay? And I got calls from supervisors pushing certain cities who are the larger cities that have more votes because they're interested in their career as well and I think that that's unfair we never get in and and you know we pay our fair share well, so I think it should yeah. have something where it's rotated and everybody gets a shot yeah and that's I think that's we've agreed we'll take that back and, and bring it forward because it like I said it's a parallel issue <coughs> on cosine yeah, and, and it is. one way yeah. of trying to address that was putting the District 3 supervisor as one of the members. But, but you've but addressed the COSIDE by creating a COSIDE council position, yes. which there's lots of committees where there's just a north, south, and uh, yeah. central county position. And, and I think you're right. The COSIDE does right. end up with the short stick. Well, and so much of it is unincorporated. Uh, so really that made sense in terms of trying to shape the, the, the board in that way. So, so we'll, we'll carry back this concern that without some rotation of positions, and I, I will tell you what, what feedback I know we'll get from some as well, if we're constantly rotating the positions, then we're not getting the experience we need on that board for the types of things that they're going to be acting on. And that would be the balance that somehow has to be, uh, has to be. I mean, your answer about the, CCAG board being 22 versus the city select committee was a good answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just not familiar with the CCAG board. Yeah. I've never participated with it. Okay. Well, well, we'll carry that back. And I, I think the concern about the what are the limits to the authority that might be uh, authorized this new agency are also good points that we'll, we'll take back. Um, I'll just continue on and, and stop me at any time because this has been a, a really good discussion. Um, it's uh, we're talking about a three-year startup, um, uh, and and, and I, I, it's been a little bit difficult sometimes to explain. We've had this process where we were developing the proposal, and so if you look maybe at the the next chart, I think it is. So so we had a part of the process which was developing the proposal that could be considered by the cities and the county. Um, with the endorsement of the Board of Supervisors and CCAG, we're now moving into the city endorsement and agreements about funding the startup of the agency, not the agency as a whole, uh, but to basically try to get it through to a point where we've identified that there is a viable uh, 
uh, ongoing funding source that would support this agency and that there's support around the county to basically, with some clarity about what we're going to do, because part of this uh, startup process um, is, is really uh, public engagement, but also doing a, uh, a uh, flood and sea level rise investment plan. Like I think Tim was saying earlier, if you don't know exactly what you're trying to fund, it's hard to define how much funding you need. And so there is, in this first three-year period, uh, the completion of a, a flood and sea level uh, uh, rise investment plan and the development of both the public in, in education process and outreach process uh, heading toward probably some combination of potential funding mechanisms that would sustain uh, this organization in support of the local jurisdiction. Uh, the funding breakdown. Um, is uh, uh, basically 50% uh, county, 50% cities. Of the county's portion, they would contribute 350000 to the startup effort and 400000 toward the uh, MOU services that are currently being provided through Erica's group. Um, the flood control district funding would remain unchanged. That's the $3.8 million that Jim talked about. But also, there's a million and a half is collected for CCAG uh, for the work that that February and, and CCAG does in the stormwater quality area. So, so that's kind of the starting point. Uh, so $1.1 million for the start of part of the process, um, with cities paying that remaining $750,000. Uh, the idea is that we get, ideally, all 21 cities uh, to participate and that we would um, have a relatively modest uh, requirement. Uh, it's actually tiered uh, so that uh, uh, Atherton would be on the lower tier and would provide $25,000 a year for three years for the startup process. Cities like Daly City and San Mateo would be at the $55,000 level. For, uh, and now in these times, uh, nothing is modest. Um, but the attempt was to try to keep the dollar amount at a level where it could be fit within uh, each agency's budget, given the difference in size of the budgets and the, and the opportunities that there are to fund it. But uh, to provide this uh, ongoing effort, it's really going to need at least uh, this level of effort. And the thought was for each year, for three years, to try to get this up and off the ground is a, a, a reasonable request. You will so, all be the you'll be the judge of that ultimately. So, it, 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 I'm not saying that that's how we would go, but if we said, or any jurisdiction said, Portola Valley, ah, I'm not interested. Now what happens? Um, we've had a lot of discussion about this, and so um, that the concept is that the the flood control district is a countywide entity, and that the thought is that that boundary would remain. The question is would all of those who are within that boundary actually pay their share? And it's conceivable that uh, some may not. Uh, I will be candid. I don't think we have a clear and concise answer to the question. Uh, the task I've been assigned is to try to get the information out so people can feel confident and join into the process as opposed to opting out. Because uh, it does make it much more complicated. When yeah, because we, you know, we ran into that when we were talking about our flood district and we wanted funding and things like that, even for the water capture facility. Uh, and as you did, the, the, you know, that uh, Bayfront Canal thing, certain jurisdictions that contribute water said, well, we're not going to participate. Yeah, we, we're interested because we tested uh, some of that as we went through the committee process, and and that the and in the outreach that we had to the local jurisdictions, and at least the feedback that we had from the elected officials that participated and the staff that participated was that everyone saw the need, and especially when you put the overlay of regional stormwater requirements coming from the regional board into the mix and potential maintenance into the mix, that agencies felt that there was going to be something there for them. Uh, where we are in the endorse endorsement process, as I mentioned, uh, the CCAG board endorsed on January 10th and the Board of Supervisors on the 29th. South San Francisco uh, has endorsed the plan and uh, they did it at their annual planning meeting, so they'll be submitting uh, an adopted uh, resolution in support of that, but they, they have the council support to move forward. And I've been in the process of scheduling meetings uh, with all the remaining 
goodies. I thank you for being early on the schedule because <laughs> the schedule is getting more complicated the later it gets. Uh, but we'll, we'll be meeting with each individual agency uh, between probably, uh, looks like now February today and April probably the second meeting for most couples in April. So hopefully then the intent is by the end of April we could get back to everyone and, and confirm that we have support and from whom. So is there a dashboard that we can look at to see when other people? Yeah, uh, Erica has been kind of managing a web page. It's, a, it's an interim web page. Um, and yeah, it's resiliencemateo.org. It it's on the back of your uh, executive summary. If, if not, it's uh, okay. yeah, just, We just want to know how our neighbors Yeah, are. If so yeah. if you go to the website and go to resources, um, it's, it's a very simple website. It's very clear. Under resources, you will see all the meetings so as a meeting comes up, we're scheduling, we're uh, listing it on there so you know other opportunities to um, listen in or participate. And, and I'll be uh, preparing some notes from tonight's meeting about what we heard so mm -hmm. we can provide that feedback into the mix. Um, I don't know if we'll end up putting all of that on the web page. Probably not because the meeting is going to be happening so quickly. I don't think we'll be able to keep up with it. But, I but would recommend, uh, if you don't mind, um, maybe the CPAC Countywide Water Committee is a, is a yes. public meeting. Yes. And we, uh, that, that meeting is this Friday, and we are giving regular updates about this uh, process and feedback that we're hearing, uh, you being the first after South San Francisco. So, okay. so I, I think we can keep that conversation going as we kind of move forward through the different communities. Uh, what we're asking for uh, from each agency is endorsement of the proposal and a, an agreement to fund the first three years of its uh, formation. So. Um, I've provided staff with a dr draft resolution uh, and uh, material that could be carried forward. That's being provided to each of the agencies in the same language, other than changes in the dollar amounts um, and town versus cities and things like that. But the basic uh, resolution is the same. And the thought is uh, we'd like to have those as soon as we can uh, obtain them. We also definitely want to know if this is a town or any council is really not prepared to support it. That's something we need to know early on as well. Um, so, so we're hope, hoping to get that feedback. We have um, uh, folks working on the legislation uh, and that um, part of what they will need is uh, acknowledgement there is support within the county uh, for the legislators to move forward with the, with the required bill. So that's what we're after uh, with the resolution for so just to make it, you're, you're going to go back to the committee and you're going to say, these are the things I heard from Atherton. Yes. And, and uh, as well as these other jurisdictions. And, you know, of course, we've asked some questions and we have some concerns. So, you know, I, I, I'm not speaking for my colleagues, but, you know, if, if I asked about how you're going to make sure you get somebody, you know, us to get somebody on the council, or on the on the board, or you know, how are we going to control the agency? Are you going to put that into the charter? We kind of would like to see that. Actually, did you reject it or did you put it in, and how that's going to be before perhaps before one one colleague or another might choose to cast a vote, yay or nay. And so um, I understand you're on a quick turntable, right? But uh, we also want to know. You heard our feedback, you're taking our feedback back, but whether or not it gets rejected and listened to is, might help with okay. vote yay or nay. Um, so. so I think the, the, so broadcasting information probably will be hard to do given the sequence of things. Uh, but um, <coughs> I can make the commitment to work with your city manager and give that feedback about kind of what happened at this or subsequent uh, water committee meetings. Uh, and what actions might be taken or are committed to being taken. There's a little bit of this ambiguity because there is no agency, right? So, so there is no board. And so uh, we're kind of dealing with the CCAC board and the Board of Supervisors as the two parts of this puzzle. So I think we have to kind of give that feedback to both the CCAC board and the Board of Supervisors as we move through. And so your comments from tonight, I'll run them by George before I even send them on just so I get it correctly. No, you're, you're herding cats. So. Okay. Yeah. But you're used yeah. to that. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? There. Yeah, George. Uh, Larry, as you take the governance issue back, you got seven member board with a number of other types of agencies that are countywide. Perhaps there's an opportunity as well to have a 
advisory committees or some tax and things like that. Yes. That council members who don't have an opportunity to serve on the board might be able to participate in some other way. Yeah, and that, I think that's that could be part of the feedback about possible options of what might be done. There is a there is a stormwater technical advisory committee that already exists at the public works directors. I mm -hmm. think Robert's been participating for some time. They had a subset which is on just stormwater. Uh, that might be a way of getting the technical side kind of plugged in. But the kind of a broader feedback from the elected officials is something that could be talked about in terms of structuring mm -hmm. this. And, and so we operate the flood control district. In the Coma Creek subzone, we have a, a um, it's, it's called an advisory committee. It's basically city council members from South City, Pacifica, Coma, Brisbane, I don't think Brisbane's in there. And there's some uh, at-large seats from residents. So that, that model is already being used in our flood control district right now. So we can bring that feedback back as well and make sure that that philosophy is discussed. Yeah. As Erica was saying, we kind of envision as a handy way of getting people on the same page, this MOU process that, that she's been using with the flood resiliency program as one mechanism to do that. That brings the cities and their city councils and staff into the loop as well. So I think uh, we can certainly see the models that are already out there to accomplish that much. And you decide if that's enough to provide the confidence that you need. I, I'm not sure I understand what the next steps would be. Let's say we endorsed and we approved. What would when would we hear from you next? What would be the next thing? Uh, so, so what we're going to be doing is, is with these meetings, we're going to basically you'll know when the meetings are occurring. Um, we will have adopted resolutions, which is the action that people take, and I think that's something that we can publish because right? mm -hmm. they will have taken a formal action with the council for tonight. You're not there, and so we would not be doing that. But if if you take action on a resolution, either in support or uh, in opposition, that's something where we would then start to show the agencies that are opting. In but but from our standpoint, let's say we do that, are we then <laughs> waiting for six months while the people get their act together? Uh, think, not or? waiting six <laughs> months, uh, but I can tell you that we're into April in terms of trying to get the all the cities, the 20 yeah. cities in the county, uh, to basically. Uh, to be able to get that just on the calendars. And yeah. But so there's, there's an actual legislative change that's required. Right, so uh, we're working with the county's um, lobbying group to determine when we're going to go to the state legislature for this change. And I, Larry, do you know any, I, I don't know the details on how yeah. it's been worked out. Well, the, the, there are two steps in the process. One is that they kind of have to announce that there's gonna be a bill. The second is, uh, toward the end of this month, they then have to have the language to be able to submit on a regular bill. There are two ways to do it, though. One is with legislation, the other is as part of the budget if there is urgency attached to what, what we're doing. So there's some uncertainty about which process is going to be used. We're going to be meeting uh, with both uh, Jerry Hill and uh, Ke Kevin Mullen's offices uh, this Friday to try to have a conversation about where we are with that process. But, um, but that would then be a, a legislative process that would not conclude before probably in June before their summer recess, I suspect. Yeah, right. uh, so, so that's kind of going on in parallel. Um, and uh, again, we won't know for sure, because if it doesn't go on the, the fast track, uh, it may be a full year before we actually get that resolved. And, and right now, the hope is, I certainly know Supervisor Pine has been anxious to see this concluded in July, um, that the, the legislature will do what the legislature does, and so we'll just have to see how that goes. So Mark Bergman is our assembly. Oh, Mark Bergman is, uh, okay. as well as member of Park. So we're not going to okay. That's a good point. Good point. Uh, Larry, and also um, the city mm -hmm. county board and the um, countywide water committee both uh, will be providing updates to them on a regular basis, and they meet monthly. Yeah. So either they, you know, a week before there's a packet that has all the information. So. Any updates will be in that packet. If, if you don't have well, maybe it was maybe George, we could loop you into that packet just so you can get the, the agenda and you can see what materials being provided to them. Okay. Any other questions for Larry? Thank you. Yeah, this is just a study session, so we can't make a decision. All right. Plus, we don't have one of our references. All right. I appreciate that. And if, if I could just know if, if and when you're going to bring it forward for action, that'd be very helpful. Yeah. And we'd be happy to be there if it's helpful. If you have more questions or you want to hear some response to the questions that you've already asked, we'd be happy to come back and bring it in. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
good. Oh, can you do it, Jerry? So, <laughs> okay.